Sound. Perfect. So let's adjust the camera so it's right. Uh, it, it, it's mirrored for us. Oh, cool. So, so, like, if you look at the. Oh, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, and now we can retreat to the back of the room. I sent the search committee. I sent to the search committee an email and said, "This is not shape months, but you guys should show up because one actually has some crossover." We'll just take some filler hostages. But I love it here. You can't tell. Like home. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's gonna be weird though. If not everyone's here and everyone's home. Should we? You have to make new friends. It's not, yeah, 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 I have to There's at least the videographer here. Yeah, that's right. Sure. Hey, what? Seriously, <laughs> 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 It really is. It smells awfully coffee. I don't want to I'm just trying to go to the next one. I have a huge binder. Nice. What do you think was hard? Yeah, you know what I'm going to ask for? Ha! You can't figure out a word. Oh, I don't know. Yes. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> research. <laughs> we were doing lots of lots of research in our OCO class. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be surprised if you read papers. What research were you doing? Exactly. Okay. That's what I'm saying. I have no idea, but I work. That is very what I spent a lot of time doing this. It's smelling like an oil. That's all I got to do. Yeah, I know. I got, I got holes. <coughs> yeah, I know. Um, but also, and I definitely did all of our labs right, and we never had to restart one single. Kylie time. definitely did not mess up a single lab, not one. Apparently, I was informed I didn't have to use a graduated cylinder right after pairing. I was like, I'm pretty sure I do. <laughs> it's just because I. Measured it out before we started boiling, so it disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we did that experiment like a lot of times. The one that he, the one we were gone on, I literally started like four times. And then I was like, yeah, you guys just have colors. Real easy to yeah. Hold on a second. Well, no, because it's 
It's fun that at first I was like really, really stressed like reading the syllabus because like we have so much to do. Yeah. Um for a slice. And I don't I don't think it's as terrible as I made it out to be. Um so yeah. Are you taking an extra some people? I think so. Yeah, because yeah. you took genetics last year. Yeah. So I will have a friend. I thought I was gonna be with children. <laughs> children. You are children. <laughs> So then Emma, she might, or she might, she'll be in physiology. Oh, she might do, okay. I'm trying to get her to convince her advisor to put her in physiology. Mm -hmm. With me? Not you. Who's not these work? No, that's what I'm saying. She should. Yeah. I didn't know these skills. I'm going to put them at the same time. I mean, but besides that, it has a good job. <laughs> oh, so you guys done the supervision? Does she does she have a job at the high school? Um, yeah, she well she was working there. Um, maybe on maternity leave, but she just came back on Monday. Later is something today, so she has off until we go to DC, and then she's coming back and she'll start with Yale then. So that'll be good. Yeah. What are you busy? She actually in the house. Is she bored? Yeah. I told her she was going to be I was like, you have to be busy. You're staying at the house? I didn't. Oh. You're just not going to be But then she was practicing like her practices. And then we were just going through and making fun of all the questions and she got wrong. Do, don't we have to do that before you student each? Yeah. You do it after. Why would you not? I would think you'd take it before. What are you supposed to? I don't know. I don't know. You just have to take it before like, you get a job. That's all I don't know. <laughs> he, oh my gosh, he just recently is trying to figure out what student each other. And so he came back one day and he was like, There's a test I have to take. 
And I was like, <laughs> what do you mean? I hope so. <laughs> and he's like, you have to test. And I was like, naturally, if you're a gay teacher, you should probably do something. And I was like, you guys are saying for you? He's like, no, I'll be okay. It's <laughs> like, so, so much no. stress. Like a 50% Did you know that? Oh my gosh. My sister, I don't think she got like a 50% and she's like looking, she's like, ah, it's still passed. I'm like, what? <laughs> That's great. Oh, so your teacher is just not like probably only passed with a 50%. Oh, so yeah. At least for like the math. Well, yeah, I need to be here. Oh, I feel like that's hard though. Do like, you have anatomy and stuff on it? I have no idea. Look at my hands. I love them. They're so cute. Oh my gosh, they're so cute. 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 I just need one more Yeah. Yeah, I've been studying. Yeah. 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 Y
But they're still flat. That's a high fructose corn syrup. Mm-hmm. It's gonna have to be that. Oh, oh, my syrup has that. I found out after that. My syrup and it has focus. How are you? Hello. Hey. Come here. Lay down. Friends are coming. Do we need to wait another minute? Do these guys have friends? Well, that, oh, that's oh, what oh, oh, I'm oh, asking. Okay. I, I apologize for being presumptuous. Um, all right, so today's speaker is Dr. Megan Kelly. Uh, Dr. I think most of you know 
Dr. Kelly, but she graduated with her doctorate in veterinary medicine in 2010 from Washington State. It's kind of weird, like College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, it's, some are not like that. Some are School of Veterinary Medicine. Um, so she graduated in 2010, practiced as a mixed animal vet, mostly equine, equine vet for five years before joining um, Western's faculty. And she teaches full time, but also operates a part time practice herself. And I think one of the real underappreciated values of um, having someone like Dr. Kelly here, is, especially as a clinician, is I've sat in her classes before and she brings her own cases to help illustrate principles and concepts, which in my opinion is sort of the epitome of experiential learning or at least showing authentic practices. Um, Dr. Kelly claims that she's not an academic, but um, she certainly has a very um, uh, ripe curiosity in these weird cases that she sees that she just can't figure out what's going on. So she tries all sorts of different tactics. And sometimes she's so clever that it's worth telling the world. So she's also published her clinical cases in the British Veterinary Association Journal, um, which is the top journal of the UK. Um, I did see that JAMA is starting to accept clinical cases, so you could have published in the top journal of America. But they weren't accepting individual clinical cases at the time. But anyway, with no further ado, Dr. Kelly. Thank you, Dr. Wood. Most of you I do recognize one way or another. So, if you know me, you know that I like questions. At any point in time, you can stop whatever rambling I'm doing, and if you have a question, please ask, however you want to formulate it. Um, this goes a lot better for me if I have an engaged audience and one that's interested. So, most of you biology majors then? Sort of, kind of, sort of, don't know yet. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I was hoping... I was hoping that we'd see some HHP folks here too, because there is some crossover in terms of a joint is a joint and how it behaves regardless of the species. It's how it works. So there is definitely some crossover and applicability between a lot of the different disciplines. So I'm hoping it'll at least reach some of you in some way, shape or form today. So today we're gonna to talk about COVID. COVID was named because he was born in 2020. And so he came in during COVID and then his dam, the mother, to him, um, her name was Corona. So it just made sense to name him COVID. That's where his name comes from. And so essentially this is a case revo report involving him and what he ended up having, which is a septic tibia tarsal joint. And can those of you out there, you and your smart young minds, tell me what the tibia tarsal joint is, is in a human? What does that equate to? Mm -hmm. What did you say loudly? Human ankle? Yes. So it's essentially your ankle. And a little bit of variability there, but human ankle is what we are talking about. So and a yearling quarter horse, here we go. So basically I formatted this like a case report, case history that you get integrated into any kind of professional type education that you might pursue going into graduate school. So this is going to be bouncing back and forth a bit between the physiology and then tying it in with the actual clinical presentation here. So history and presentation. COVID presented September 23rd, 2021. And the complaint was that he was lame. And according to the American Association of Equine Practitioners Lameness Scale, out of five, five is non-weight bearing lame, so not bearing weight at all. Four means that you can see the lameness, you can see the pain, at a walk. So grade four out of five lame on his left rear. And he had regional swelling around the tarsal curl joint or tibia tarsal joint. And on the outside, the lateral aspect of the hawk, he had a smidge, not a ton, of watery yellow purulent discharge. So watery yellow pussy discharge. And it was draining from the small wound on that plantar lateral aspect. So history that the owner then recalled for me was that he noticed or thought he noticed the wound, saw the wound about four days prior. And what ends up happening often enough with septic joints or tendon sheaths or bursas and horses, large animals, is they tend to appear minor 
a lot of times they're very small wounds, don't bleed a lot, don't seem to be that severe in nature, but it's not about the size of the wound, it's about the location. And so in this case, since it appeared minor and there's no swelling or lameness or drainage or hemorrhage, then it didn't make a lot of sense to necessarily be that concerned about it. So this is not COVID, but for reference, I didn't have a picture from when he presented. So for reference, this is a four-year-old quarter horse that you can see the regional swelling along the hawk from this view. And then this actually is his medial plantar pouch of the tibiotarsal joint, and he has the same characteristic drainage coming out of it. <clears throat> so different horse, different age, different color, as you'll see COVID as a Palomino, but essentially this represents exactly how he looked on that day. So considerations, this is where the practical side of things comes in and we deviate a little bit from the research side. From a practical standpoint, there's a number of considerations to think about. So first of all, duration. Four days anyway, in terms of when there was a penetrating injury. What joint is involved in the anatomy associated with it? So not all joints are created equal as far as their size and shape and they have outpouchings. So with the hawk and the tibiotarsal joint, there's a plantar pouch, a lateral and medial, plus the dorsal aspect of the pouch. And it's, a, it's quite a large joint. So it doesn't, it, it's not exactly symmetrical and it is not what you would think of as say a capsule that is circular. So depending on the joint, some of them are quite small and don't have much for outpouchings and others like the stifle are large and have three compartments to that. So depending on the size and essentially the anatomy involved, sometimes a septic joint is easier to clean up than others, depending on accessibility and depending on where bacteria can hide. A more regular joint that has some size to it and not a lot of pouches or areas that outwardly change shape, those are areas that can really be a reservoir for infection. And, it, and the bacteria can hide. So something the real honest that is like the fetlock joint, yes, it has plantar pouches or palmar pouches, but it's a reasonable size, pretty easy to lavage, pretty easy to handle. Coffin joint, that's the distal interphalangeal joint, very small, has a capacity fluid-wise of maybe about five cc's, five milliliters. And coffin joints are often quite hard to clean up because you don't get good access from anything advanced like an arthrotomy or being able to use a scope. It's such a small joint that damage happens really fast and time is really critical as far as duration on cleaning up a joint like that. So the anatomy matters and the joint that is involved matters. Age of the horse. So this is more my consideration necessarily than somebody else's, but a lot of what goes into determining whether or not you choose to treat something like this is the age of the animal. Young animals, better regenerative capacity, better healing capacity, have potentially their whole lives in front of them. A geriatric, so an older horse, might not be worth the money to spend, might not be worth pursuing treatment. And then from my standpoint, with the practice that I operate out of, I don't have a legitimate surgery room. So I have to take in consideration safety of anesthetizing a 1200 pound animal and whether I want to be the one that is anesthetizing that animal or whether I want to pass it along to somebody else with a better facility. With COVID, he's a yearling and he was roughly 800 pounds. And so it was a little bit easier for me to tackle a project like that where size is a little bit less of an issue and we can maintain some safety, um, safety for the horse during recovery, safety for any humans that are involved, and then even just safety and damage to the facility when something like that has to wake up from the anesthesia. Size of the patient, segueing into that. Again, considerations for the size of the animal and what is going on. And then whether or not to refer. So in a clinical setting, as a practitioner, you have to be honest with yourself and decide what your clinical capabilities are and what your skill level is. And then you have to be honest with the owner of the animal also and say, all right, this is out of my wheelhouse. I am not your best person. I'm not your best resource for successfully treating this. And in that case, it becomes a conversation of if you want to pursue treatment 
here are the phone calls I can make and we can try to get this animal seen by somebody that's more qualified to do it. The other scenario on the referral side of things too is here in a second budget is going to pop up. And so a lot of what determines whether or not something goes to a tertiary care facility like a university or a very large advanced veterinary facility is money. And if somebody else heard me say this, I might get in trouble, but the higher up you go on the food chain and the pecking order in veterinary medicine, the closer you get to university and academia, the less practical <coughs> people are and they have overhead and they have costs associated with that. So if they're going to take on a case, they have to make sure that they charge enough to make it feasible for them to keep their doors open and charge enough for the people that they have working there. So there's a fair amount that goes into referral pricing and costs and also whether or not they're willing to do a happy medium. So more in general practice, not the referral or tertiary care side of things, we're a little bit more open to working with clients and working with the owners and the animals to try to find a happy medium type approach to being able to hopefully give the animal a chance, it might not be top tier, but it's better than saying, nope, not gonna try. So a lot of it really does come down to whether the client wants to refer to a higher end tertiary type facility and what kind of budget they have. If the money isn't there, it limits your decision making, so to speak. There's budget. And then really what it also comes down to is if you can recognize what's going on and in the literature as I was reviewing it, there was a lot of repeated mention on septic joints, septic arthritis, um, septic synovial structures, and that it's not as easy to recognize. And from a clinician standpoint, a lot of times diagnosis isn't made right away, it's missed. And some of it again is based on appearance of the wound and location and some of the factors that go into recognizing that it's not as easy to diagnose as one might think. So from a prognosis standpoint, in, in talking one, you have to be able to recognize it. And then two, on the full recovery side of things, we have a yearling quarter horse here. He hasn't even gone into training. He's only worth so much. And if he's not going to be a performance animal, if he's not going to have a riding career, it doesn't make a ton of sense to invest any money into treating him if he's going to be a pasture pet. Does that make sense? Okay. So with the full recovery scenario, it might be different in terms of a breeding animal. He's a gelding. If he was a stud or a mare, you could tolerate maybe some soundness issues if there is another usage for that animal. So just for reference in the joint we're specifically talking about, the dorsal aspect of the hawk here on this effusive tibia tarsal joint, here's the dorsal aspect, and then this is going to be the plantar lateral pouch. And so where COVID actually is injured is a teeny tiny little, little spot that was already closed up above the effusive lateral pouch right there, plantar lateral pouch. And here it is in all its glory in a, in a more normal hawk. But this is how they end up getting injured through penetrating injuries, because essentially you have the epidermis, dermis, and a titia sub Q, and then you're at the synovium. So it doesn't take much of anything for a horse to graze themselves against the fence line at that location and penetrate into that synovial structure. It's right there, and there's no protection. And then for reference, as far as just basic anatomy of a joint, um, conceptualized here, some of the words I'm going to throw out is going to be essentially <clears throat> the area of bone. Oh, I remember that this is sensitive. The area of bone that supports the cartilage is called the subchondral bone. So whether you're talking the proximal portion of the joint or the distal portion, the bone that <coughs> is supporting the cartilage itself composing the joint is called the subchondral bone. And then you've got the articular cartilage, which in a high motion joint is going to be hyaline cartilage. The green represents the synovial fluid that lubricates the joint. And then the yellow represents the synovial membrane, which is the synovium composed of synoviocytes. And then the blue represents the joint capsule. And then you've got collateral ligaments that stabilize the joint, but just basic anatomy of how a joint is put together. And then the 
anatomy of the hawk specifically, the joint we are talking about is the large high motion tibiotarsal joint. And in the hawk region of the horse, there are four joints. Um, another thing on the anatomy is with the tibiotarsal joint, it often communicates, oh, that's interesting, uh, with the proximal intertarsal joint. So it's not about just cleaning up the tibiotarsal joint. You also have to understand that there may be some contamination of the other corresponding joints, which can make resolution difficult. Oh, I lost it. I may get you back to There we go. So another consideration again is duration. And so this is another horse that this is once the injury is healed and about the time of suture removal, that this wound in this location, if it is deep enough and extends dorsal enough, you get into the coffin joint. So that's the distal interphalangeal joint. And this horse, it was a happy coincidence and really, really lucky for this animal because he was had an appointment to come in to have his carpal arthritis, his knee arthritis evaluated. And the day prior to the appointment, he got a laceration at that location. And so then the owner thought, well, we've got the appointment anyway. When we bring him in, we'll have that wound evaluated. So when he came in, my focus immediately switched, didn't really even hardly touch on his arthritis and said, well, we got to take a deeper look at this wound. And as it turned out, that was a septic coffin joint. And then he stayed for a couple of weeks hospitalized with lavages to get that joint healed up. But from a duration standpoint, that was just pure luck that he came in timing wise within 24 hours because this joint is small. It is not forgiving to infection and duration really, really matters when it comes to this joint. And then as a statistic, you guys have read this by now, but statistically, 53% of horses admitted within 24 hours of injury develop septic arthritis, and 65% of these survived within 24 hours of presentation injury. But then we advanced to two to seven days from injury, and now we've got 92% of horses that develop septic arthritis and less than 40% of them that resolve. So from the prognosis standpoint and considering what's the goal of the horse, is it acceptable if there is some lameness or does this horse have to be perfectly sound? What's its job going to be? So with synovial sepsis, not only are we then talking about or trying to factor in short-term survival, but we have to think about long-term athletic performance. Do we have a chance to give this horse an athletic career? So again, the goal of therapeutic intervention is one, you have to eradicate the etiologic agent. So you have to eradicate the bacterial infection. You got to get it 100% gone. That's the first step. You also have to manage the joint well enough through the process to be able to restore the normal synovial environment. And third, if you restore the normal synovial environment, maybe you've got a chance then of preserving full function. And where we get a little bit of divergence on the human side versus the horse side, is as humans, we can tolerate some joint pain and some dysfunction. There's a lot involving medicine on the human side that can help that, and we can manage that better. Also, we can hop around on one leg. A horse cannot. They need all four legs. They need to be bearing weight on all four legs, and it's really a primary consideration that they have to get as comfortable as possible as fast as possible, and they have to stay that way. Otherwise, there just isn't any hope for them. So then despite intensive treatment, the prognosis for septic arthritis is guarded, always is, doesn't really matter time frame. We're going to warn everybody that presents a horse in with a septic type process in a joint or another synovial structure. We hope that this is going to work, but statistically, your horse might be one of them that just does not respond well, cannot get it cleaned up. So this is where this range is just crazy in terms of 27% to 81% range as far as prognosis and return to full activity. A lot of that comes from where maybe there could be some better research into trying to differentiate whether these statistics are coming from, say, more of a private small practice 
um, general practitioner scenario or whether this is coming from the university scenario or somewhere in between. Um, the statistics are going to very much depend on the type of animals, the type of owners, and really how things are handled in those practices. So a real wide range in terms of return to full activity. And it's gonna be dependent on the facility, the animals being treated, the type of clientele, how many of them are electing to treat and how many of them are choosing to euthanize without even trying. And is there some kind of a happy medium offered as this is gonna be the case with COVID or is it just an absolute? And so it's gonna really drastically affect the statistics, which then makes it tough from a practitioner standpoint to give a good, honest, solid, scientific answer as far as, well, this is gonna work out or it's not gonna work out for your horse. So etiology, really this can be divided up in terms of common and uncommon. And so commonly there's really three ways that joints get infected. And so in an adult horse, more often than not, it's contamination via a wound. So penetrating injury into the joint. In young horses, foals especially, it's hematogenous, meaning you end up with septicemia, bacteremia, leading to septicemia, leading to areas that tend to seed with bacteria, which joints are a very common spot. And in foals, that's because of failure of passive transfer, so not good antibody protection. Um, did not get good immunoglobulins through the milk and then therefore get sepsis within about a week or so of life. So that's the hematogenous side. And then on the iatrogenic, this is where we get into medicine and treating horses with lameness and where you certainly have crossover into human is on iatrogenic, that means human caused essentially. So now we're into intraarticular injections to say, try to help joints, improve comfort, keep horses sound or on the human side, um, same medications are used as far as steroids into joints and keeping say a degenerating hip or knee happy. And so if there is contamination from the injection and the bacteria are seeded via the injection in the needle, you end up with a septic joint. Less commonly, it can occur as an extension of a wound that is outside of the joint. And as necrosis occurs, tissue necrosis occurs from the action of the wound and the degeneration of the tissue, you can end up with sepsis getting in as the capsule erodes and you get into the synovium that way. And then sometimes there just isn't a cause and you get into just have no idea how this happened. We're going to call it idiopathic. Probably is a cause. We're just not going to know what it is. So this is where it gets a little busy for a second. And this is not, <laughs> this is not even close to complete as far as the pathophysiology of how a joint essentially ends up destroyed from a bacterial infection. And it does. It ends up destroyed. So right up here at the top, Synovitis and capsulitis, essentially that is inflammation of the synovium and of inflammation of the joint capsule. And physically, this can be appreciated, and I'll point it out to you in the video here in a second, but the capsule and the synovium thicken very fast with inflammation. And as that is happening, then it makes it that much harder to get the degenerative process under control and to get the infection under control. It becomes its own physical barrier and its own worst enemy. So we start the process of release of enzymes, inflammatory mediators, and cytokines. And then with this synovial sepsis, we get increased vascular permeability. So in other words, with inflammation, vessels dilate. And the reason vessels dilate is to allow for what naturally needs to come in to fight infection to have a, a route and a pathway to do it. So as vessels dilate, you're going to have incoming macrophages, neutrophils, and fibrin into the joint compartment. So the character of the joint is changing. And then neutrophils, their responsibility is to phagocytize bacteria. They gobble them up, eat them, present them elsewhere for recognition. And in the process of doing that, they're going to release enzymes and free radicals, which cleave proteoglycans, collagen, and hyaluronic acid. And these are major functional components within the joint to keep it happy. So then that leads to decreased synovial fluid viscosity. And I spaced it out. I was going to actually bring some synovial fluid for a touch and feel exercise today, but I did not. And what this amounts to then is you get watery joint fluid. 
And this means that lubrication is decreased and biomechanical protection of the joint is no longer there. You have a joint that is unhappy and not functioning as it should. And then down here to wrap it up, inflammatory mediators released from the synovium activate the synoviocytes, the cells that compose the synovium, and the chondrocytes, the cartilage cells. And this produces inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. So then interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha increase the production of MMPs, matrix metalloproteinases. And what these lovely MMPs do is through a process of signaling of their own, they cause cartilage degradation, cartilage fibrillation, and chondrocyte necrosis. So they change the entire capacity of the joint to do its job, which leads to further inflammation, synovial fusion, intrasynovial pressure increases, which reduces blood flow, causes ischemia, so a lack of blood flow, and then that's going to change the actual subchondral bone and the cartilage itself and lead to further and further pain. By the time you get down here to ischemia, you're into this irreversible chronic process where the joint is essentially destroyed. And what you have left, if you radiograph, you're going to see bone changes. We're, we're in stage here. The joint is never going to recover from this. And there is a lot of the inflammatory cascade that I left out of this lovely slide. But the bottom line is not only do you have to kill the bacteria, eradicate the etiologic agent, but you have to manage the inflammation. If you don't get the inflammation under control, you still don't have a joint. So I was trying to be creative here a little bit and thought it would be good to give you a visual of what I can't provide because I don't have an arthroscope. Our patient is a known case of un. I'm just going to mute this because we don't need the commentary. But this is a visual of a trashed septic joint in a human, and this is the knee. So your guys' knee. And what you're seeing essentially is a biopsy tool, debridement tool, using an arthroscope in. And what is normal, or at least a bit more normal, is the cartilaginous surface, the hyaline cartilage there within the knee. But then all of the other fuzzy, all of that, that's fibrillated cartilage and fibrin accumulation. And ultimately, the end result of this video and why it was published is this surgeon is going in and essentially debriding the synovium and taking out all of the unhealthy synovium to try to give the joint a chance to recover from this chronic septic process in a human. And the idea behind that is there gets to be so much damage and so much, what is the debris, that the bacteria, even if you throw everything you've got at cleaning up the septic process, you're never gonna get it cleaned up because there's too much debris and too much physical barrier to get it done. So it, it really takes roto rooting the joint to get something like this cleaned up. And that's ultimately what ended up happening here was reduction of the synovium. So taking out right there, taking out essentially chunks of the most superficial aspect of the synovium to again, try to get down. And the fancy word or medical terminology for a joint that looks like this and the characteristics of that is this is panis. So this is basically end stage destruction of the synovium and so much accumulation of fibrin type products and gelatin from the bacteria hanging out in there that there just isn't hardly any normal surface left. Just thought I'd give you the visual of what the worst of the worst looks like. So as far as diagnosis, back to COVID. Yeah. So does that help increase the mobility after that? Or was that yes. It yeah. So it's going to help with in increasing mobility for sure. And then again, if you can get back to normal tissue, then you have the chance, one, of clearing the infection, and then two, maybe getting to the point where you can get that inflammatory process under control. And then on the human side of things, 
long term, you've got to get the infection under control, and then that person's probably going to get a knee replacement. But you've got to get the infection gone first. So in a horse, this would, would be the end stage procedure done to try to have a salvageable animal for breeding or pasture management. So we can't go any further than just aggressive debridement. So on the diagnosis side of things, um, this is not COVID again. This is a, oh, what is she? I think she's a three-year-old show horse. And her wound, and this is a video I'll show it to you in a second, but she has a wound over the dorsal aspect of the tibiotarsal joint. And I lost a lot of sleep over this horse because in practice, what you learn in academia does not always <laughs> coincide with what you see out in practice. And essentially the animals don't read the book or the patients or the humans don't read the book. So there's always a gray area. And this lovely mare fell into the gray area. And the very first thing that is done is a synoviocentesis, meaning you collect a joint fluid sample. And that gets analyzed as far as total protein content and white cell content to get an idea of whether there's a septic process in there or not. And the once that sample is collected, which I did collect one from her, then we get to this amateur video here showing a sterile process where I'm back at this lateral plantar pouch and I am distending the tibia tarsal joint with sterile saline. And this is a quick and dirty test to see if the joint holds pressure or if the fluid comes out the wound. If the fluid comes out the wound, the wound communicates with the joint, this is a septic joint. And that's just an easy recognition besides doing the laboratory analysis. Um, <clears throat> there was a lot of loss of sleep on this mare because she had a fusion, she had a little bit of lameness, and I couldn't decide whether this was a septic joint or not, mainly because here we have normal parameters for total protein at two grams per deciliter and a white cell count of under 200 cells per microliter. With her values, she has a total protein just above that at 2.2 and a white cell count of 1,500 cells. And what that amounts to is she's got inflammation, but does she have infection? And that's where my loss of sleep came from because really for a septic joint, you get above four grams per deciliter and above 30,000 white cells with better than 80% 80, better than 80 of that being neutrophils. Uh, say you were to treat a joint that was just inflamed and not uh, infected, what would be the repercussions of that? Um, not a lot on repercussions other than cost and waste of time and maybe more risk to the owner. Um, with this mare, let's see if I can deal with this here, is there's risk associated with putting a needle into the joint. This joint is clean. She actually, she wasn't septic. This joint is clean, so this has to be a sterile prep and penetration, and we have to minimize the chance of me seeding an infection in here. So part of the principle of doing some procedure like this is you have to stay away from the wound. You cannot have the needle anywhere near the wound and seed bacteria into it. And then from the standpoint of what Isabeau is asking is what is the risk? And so from this standpoint, minimal risk there other than seeding the joint was something that already wasn't there. And then at the end of this also, I've got a needle in there. I'm going to be proactive and I'm going to add some antibiotic. So at the end of this, I injected some antibiotic into this mare to be on the safe side. So direct intraarticular injection. And then I took a, a happy median approach on this horse and I didn't think she was septic, but I didn't know for sure. So she stayed and went on IV antibiotics and took a proactive approach, but not the top tier side of things. Yeah. In um, I'm in the evolution right now and we discussed antibiotics today. So, and we were just discussing um, how, um, especially like in the human field of um, doctoring, um, doctors tend to like over prescribe antibiotics and it's causing a whole bunch of issues. Yep. So is it, like the best thing to push antibiotics if you aren't sure if it's needed? Good question. And you're absolutely right. No, it is not a great idea to use antibiotics inappropriately. And especially in terms of resistance, um, the more we use antibiotics and we don't use them judiciously, judiciously, the more likely you are that we're going to have antibiotic resistance and no ability really to treat a legitimate infection. And then other issues to think about with antibiotic administration is think about your normal bacteria flora 
And when you start giving systemic antibiotics to an animal or to a human, now we're disrupting that flora and we can cause other complications that the animal or the human didn't have to begin with by that administration. In veterinary medicine, it gets to be a bit complicated in terms of, as far as I'm concerned, this was proactive and may have been more than it needed to be, but I would have hated to be wrong. And with the duration side of things, again, if I wasn't proactive and there was an issue, by the time it was recognized, I'd be two days behind where I was at there. So it, it is a risk assessment and it's basically let's choose the lesser of the evils. And proactive with a livestock animal is usually the better way to go. And also dictated by who we are serving, which is the owner. And we have to keep whoever is paying the bill happy and try to keep their animals healthy and happy. She has a wound, she's got a wound over a joint. This level of antibiotics and care is, is justified in this case, but you're right. There needs to be more consideration in human and animal as far as how we're using antibiotics. So here's COVID. <laughs> we finally get to COVID. And <clears throat> diagnosis on him was a bit tricky, but essentially it was, again, an arthrocentesis. So going in and taking a fluid sample and looking at the protein, white cell count, and whether or not there was wound contamination and communication. With him, he had such a small wound that I could not prove communication. It had already closed. So what I was going off of was clinical appearance, lameness, and drainage from original drainage that the owner reported. And then by the time the leg blew up like this, that's a pretty good clue. Clinical appearance then. And then I note this here with a question mark. SAA stands for serum amyloid A. At the time, I didn't have this test within the practice. I do now. But this is an acute phase protein that raises rapidly and elevates fast with infection or inflammation. And when there is any sort of trouble with interpreting whether there is a septic event or not, it's helpful in terms of monitoring it for a trend. And typically it has a relatively high value when you have a septic joint. Wasn't something I had to fall back on at the time. Um, once I got the sample from COVID, it was a no-brainer. Total protein of 5.6, 27,000 white cells, better than 90% of those were neutrophils. So with him, dilution is the solution to pollution. So this is his first joint lavage. And what is not real clear here, and there's another video that will demonstrate improvements, but this is under extreme high pressure. And there isn't good blood, there isn't good fluid flow out the needles, which means that there's quite a lot of fibrin accumulation and a thickened capsule. And then the view was just to show an anesthetized horse, the IV hooked up with the GKX, which was the anesthesia he was on, and then the overall apparatus of the two needles for egress, and then the dorsal needle here, that line goes to a fluid bag, a liter of um, would be sterile lactated ringers under high pressure. What was unfortunate was the lavage just wasn't going great. Um, once that joint gets real contaminated and thickened, um, the diameter of the needle, quite frankly, they plug up and you can't flush well because there's just too much junk in there. So this is kind of getting the scary range on him in terms of are we even going to physically be able to clean this up? With why he stayed with me and didn't go elsewhere is the owners had X amount of money they were willing to spend. They had budget considerations and they didn't want to refer. They just said, you treat them, otherwise we're probably not going to treat them. So he stayed with me and, and we, did the, we did the management on him. So joint lavage with arthroscopy where a scope goes in is ideal. Don't have a scope, so just strictly needle joint lavage. Intraarticular antibiotics. Um, I'll get into this here in a minute, but direct antibiotic administration is extremely important into the joint. And you get way higher um, minimum inhibitory concentrations for longer than you can ever achieve with systemic antibiotics. So then, then we get into the systemics and it needs to be broad spectrum. And so you have to cover both gram positive and gram negative. 
and aminoglycosides get the gram negative, and then beta lactams, which are the penicillins, or cephalosporins for the gram positive side of things. And then non steroidal anti inflammatories, exclamation points. It gets really, really, really important. Again, you've got to get this inflammatory process under control. So decrease the inflammation and discomfort. And then what it also tends to do is reduces the collagenase activity, which breaks down collagen. And so then within the synovial structures, you get a decrease in prostaglandin E and you get a production essentially with that decrease that allows for this slowing down effect of collagen breakdown. So there's some effect in terms of actually trying to decrease on the inflammatory cascade, the damage being done. So then on the treatment side, important as far as treating with antibiotics systemically to maintain a sufficiently high concentration. And with that serum antibiotic concentration, some of the drugs, you can't achieve that MIC safely. You have to use too high of a concentration of drug, which is going to then damage the kidneys or other systemic systems, and you can't achieve that concentration for long enough. So it gets to be a real consideration as far as what drugs we can use systemically that get and maintain at an MIC that will inhibit growth for a long period of time. So then on the pharmacokinetic side, whether it's intraarticular or systemic, is that pre-existing inflammation will affect how well the antibiotics work. And so again, it's real important on the duration side, the earlier you catch this, the better. On the upside with intraarticular, as I mentioned, genomycin, amikacin, or ceftiafir um, work really well in a joint as a administered into the joint scenario and exceed that threshold of sensitivity for at least 24 hours at way better concentrations. So here's the uh, second time he was flushed and a much better lavage this time in terms of I'm using a different approach to get it in into the lateral pouch, but then nice flow coming out of those needles under high pressure, doing a better job of lavaging this. And this is the idea again, dilution is the solution to pollution. And then at the end, put in intraarticular antibiotics and go from there. I think right there, that was his wound. That was a little pinprick that caused all of this damage. So the bottom line with the treatment on lavage, large volumes, usually three liters at a time that get flushed into the joint. And then again, with that, ideally we have a wound that will flush and that's the egress portal. And then we're simultaneously decreasing the bacterial population just with dilution and trying to break up, get out some of that fiber and get out the debris that's causing the inflammation and try to make a happy joint again. So his highlights, COVID's highlights, presented September 23rd of 20, Arthrocentesis standing. In other words, I tried to get a joint tap from him standing. He's yearling. He didn't like the needles. Had to anesthetize him to start treatment. Owners really weren't sure at the time if they wanted to be aggressive or not. So a day passed where he went on appropriate broad spectrum antibiotics and anti-inflammatories, but really not yet best case scenario as far as care. They decided to get aggressive the next day. We anesthetized him, um, performed the arthrocentesis, got the numbers, injected amikacin into the joint, and performed the lavage. Owners were like, well, let's give it some time. Let's see how this does. He's, let's see what we can minimize as far as cost. So he actually went five days before he got real bad again. And then we had to go back to being aggressive and even get more aggressive. Lavaged his joint again intraarticular antibiotics, and then systemic antibiotics were kept the same. From there, on the first two days later, joint lavage, intraarticular genomycin, so I switched up the aminoglycoside, different volume, different concentration, and then we switched to potassium penicillin. Um, so potassium penicillin frequency-wise is given three to four times a day. And it gets a better concentration, but it costs a lot more. And frequency is much more than procaine penicillin G, which is IM and dirt cheap and given twice a day. 
So we're starting to get into a lot of costs trying to take care of COVID. On the 3rd of October, now we are 10 days, wait, yeah, 10 days into things. After discussion with the owner, um, they didn't want to spend any more as far as lavage, but they said go ahead and anesthetize him, go ahead and get a joint sample, go ahead and put another antibiotic do dose in the joint, but we're done with the lavage side of things. And when I got those numbers at total protein of 4.2 and white cells of 4,500, pretty happy, but I really still don't like that 4.2 protein level. So this is where it was kind of stop as far as the hospitalization and the expense expense. And he was discharged the next day on IV Ceftaflex, which is a Ceftafir antibiotic for, for the uh, gram positives. And then still continuing genomycin IV and Butte as the anti-inflammatory orally. So he went on to still a IV broad spectrum antibiotic regimen, but now he's getting dosed basically two times a day, once with the Ceftaflex and once with the Gent, and then he's getting an oral NSAID. So this is something the owners ended up being able to manage. It was a family event and they all came and they all got coached on how to maintain an IV catheter and how to keep to the time frame and how to inject the antibiotics and flush the catheter. And the family worked together to make sure he got his medications for another two weeks as instructed. And this was then again how cost was kept down and he still got treated. So here's ideal, good old YouTube. So under top tier type scenario, this is gonna be a septic fetlock, but ahead of anesthesia, everything is gonna get clipped and prepped. And then the horse is anesthetized, put on a surgery table, hydraulic surgery table, um, in dorsal recumbency, so the legs are up, and then everything is sterilely prepped, covered. Um, the joint has already been distended with sterile fluid to make it large enough and out um, distended enough that it makes it easy for the surgeon to make the approaches with the scalpel to then get the arthroscope in. Um, a deflated joint doesn't work well as far as getting into it with arthroscopy. And then the same scenario, just with way larger portals and the ability to actually directly look at and evaluate the joint. Outcome, bottom line here. So I copied the discharge instructions over for COVID, but I explained them to you guys. And again, instructed for the IV antibiotics and how to maintain the IV catheter. He was maintained on oral phenobutazone. And then the antibiotics continued for 14 days from discharge. I rechecked him on the 22nd, a few days after antibiotics had been discontinued, and I was, wasn't happy. Um, he had gotten out. He had a little romp around out of his pen. He caused some inflammation in his joint. And his joint was still pretty effusive and painful when he flexed it up and he moved off. So he was still pretty inflamed in the joint with a minimal amount of um, work with it, I suppose, and torsion to it. And at this point, I'm thinking, all right, you know, this horse is toast. He's going to survive, but he's never going to have a career. He's never going to be an athlete. And so I warned them, I mean, warned them from day one till now and said, well, we tried, but this isn't looking good, guys. So then fast forward actually to that spring and I was out at this ranch where COVID was at and he said, and now it's probably February, January, February. And he said, you know what? COVID's doing great. I'm like, no, you're kidding, right? There's no way. And he'd been turned out and just kind of let live. And this is where that age side of things come in because he was young. And his joint did what joints sometimes do, which is regenerate a bit, heal on its own. All of the fusion was gone. Anytime they watched him move, he was sound. He looked good. And so then that fall, I think this one is going to work. He went to the trainer. So there's actually a few different videos in the interest of time. I won't go through them all. But now he's at the trainer, essentially a year later, 
his joint looks perfect and between the trainer and the owner and everybody watching, there's no lameness issue. And everybody's pretty happy about that. I would never have given a plug nickel for this horse. 25 cents would have probably been more than what I would have bet on him. Mm -hmm. But being young, given some time and the body's ability to heal, he didn't read the book. He was way past duration as far as recognition and good outcome. He was long past really getting top tier type care. There was a lot of indecision that delayed treatment and a, a fair amount of effect that could have gone to a horse that never took a sound step in, in his life. But he exceeded expectations and broke the rules. So to date, now he is three years old and there has not been any lameness seen or noted and he has a productive job as a ranch horse and he's expected to be usably sound. Bottom line, if I wanted to investigate further, I would really like to radiograph his hawk. Um, ignorance is bliss though. I might not want to see what is inside that joint and see the bony changes because I bet there are some there. I doubt that radiographically this horse is normal. But you can't ride radiographs. And so a horse that is sound and usable, go with it. And if something comes up later on, hopefully then we'll get the opportunity to manage it. But as of right now, a pretty dang good happy ending for what wasn't really going to be the case. As far as future research, things I thought about, mainly it comes to autologous therapies. So these are your blood harvested type therapies. Um, protein-rich plasma, IRAP, so what is that, interleukin receptor antagonist protein. Um, and then there's a few others, and these are blood-borne, blood-harvested autologous products. So you take the blood from the horse, process it, get all of the good out of the blood, and inject it into the joints. And this is usually used for performance horses, but it has application to you on the sepsis side. Um, what you do have to be careful with is that these therapies right now are not recommended to be put into the joint until there's complete resolution of any infection. As a blood product, you're potentially adding fuel to the infection if the timing isn't right. There is, however, one product out there. It's amnion-based, so it's not a cellular product. It comes from the amniotic fluid and amniotic sac of mares. It's called Renovo. And it's demonstrated antimicrobial properties and it has a fibrinolytic effect. So it'll break down fibrin. And so this is a much safer product and it's actually recommended to be put into joints when there is still an active infection because it's demonstrating some of these properties and doesn't have the same blood product type properties that make something like that dangerous to put into an active infected joint. So there does actually need to be a fair amount of more research and documentation to prove timing, to make best recommendations for when some of these products would best be served going into a joint like this. And then get the option with him. So that said, I had to add in a little bit of gore. So this is my <laughs> impact factor take home message is it is really not about the size of the wound. It is about the location. The horse that is mutilated here on her chest on the left she'll survive, regardless of whether it is sutured, regardless of whether there's a whole lot of care into this or not. This looks to be the worst thing ever, but it doesn't have an impact on the horse. This itty bitty wound into the blue realm here, that's a big deal. And that's a way worse scenario for prognosis and survival than our lovely laceration there on the left. So I couldn't resist. I didn't have this in, but I put it in about an hour ahead of time. So there's the resources. And now that I have put you guys to sleep, questions? Is there any possibility that COVID, one of the reasons that he's feeling good is there was some form of nerve damage? I don't know what nerves might be there, that he's not feeling anything from any different uh, bone growth. I don't think so. Um, just how the joint is organized and how the nerves innovate the area. If, the th if there was a fair amount of inflammation in the joint, he would feel it. Mm -hmm. and so I don't think that there is a nerve related side of things to it. Um, larger injuries that sever some of the nerves that are gonna innervate the areas, potentially there could be some lack of sensation and that might affect um, comfort level of the horse, but not in this case. 
Well, uh, as you as you showed us here, is that you, said that you did everything within your realm of knowledge and possibility to do. Uh, I'll trim any you had uh, <coughs> hedged your bets on his uh, recovery. But yeah. he made that we made that progress recovery. Um, is this one of those situations where a where if an ever veterinarian was working on it, that they might agree that they would reach a similar consensus, or, or, or is this one of those like one in a million stories where the horse just got really lucky on, on, on that main Sure. So the consensus across most of the profession is going to be that that um, boy, you better start thinking that COVID is not going to have a future. That's going to be the consensus, and quite frankly, that starts right at presentation as far as starting with that longer duration at time of presentation with the wound to how he was clinically responding to then what he did. Um, it was encouraging while he was getting treated. He was responding clinically quite nicely. The effusion was gone. He was seeing sound of the walk. He was responding as you would expect. Numbers were coming in down in the joint. But that duration side of things really, really plays into how much damage it has before treatment even starts. So really what then plays into long-term is how that joint does or doesn't recover. So yeah, he was, I don't think he'd be a one in a million, but he's, he's definitely the exception to the rule. And that's where it's challenging from the prognostic standpoint in terms of you have to make recommendations to these animal owners and the normal recommendation is probably going to be, you might not want to continue, you know, if there isn't the need or isn't the ability to keep the horse and give it more time, odds are that this horse is not going to recover and call it quits now if you can't afford the feed or to keep the horse around when it is lame. So, yes, I'd say he's the exception, but more and more I'm seeing a fair amount of these joints that duration-wise they're not in the greatest shape, but they're mainly responding well to treatment, and that is opposite of what I was taught. That's opposite of what um, academia and the professionals, the clinicians were seeing. But their perspective is significantly different in terms of where they're operating out of, what they're doing compared to someone that is a bit more in the, in the trenches side of things. And it's really about whether the owner wants to give it a try. If the owner wants to defy the odds and they want to spend the money, I'll give it a whirl because there's always a case. And in every situation, there's always a case that will beat the odds. And that's why you try. I guess a uh, follow up question because it sounds like uh, uh, part of the, um, part of the uh, key, one of the main uh, hurdles for, uh, for determining whether treatment actually is going to work or not is it always comes down to the bottom dollar of uh, literally money, money issues. Yep. Um, if, uh, is there, it means, or I don't know if I have parsed this part, uh, uh, but it's like if money was not even a, a factor at all, like it's just like it, it, you know, blank check, you know, or yep. just do it, just do it for the sake of doing it. Yep. Um, it would, is there, if, if the money question was out of the picture for a solving case like these, would it make it easier to? figure out, uh, find new innovations for how to go about these things. Because it's, sure. to me, it seems like that, like there's times where it's like, it's like yes, the horse could have been safe, but the person, the, per the owner couldn't afford to do yep. it. So it's like, yep. it just, it's like, it, it just seems like, you know, it's like having to, it could have just not, I don't know, just not having that um, ability to, to, to leap at that opportunity sure. to try to do something. Sure. And, and that's where research comes into play and in that there's a fair amount just from the time of this presentation. There is actually a lot of other treatment options and things that have been explored, including polymethyl methacrylate beads. So slow release antibiotics into a joint scenario like this. And then just even in the unlimited scenario, this is where you could certainly take an arthroscope and go in into bride just like that first video and try to clean off something that's chronic. It's just really based on what is available and, and what needs to be spent, which is a contrast to human medicine where there's insurance and the ability to treat even if the money isn't there up front or during. Um, veterinary medicine has its challenges with, with having to find a way to pay for things one way or another. 
just on the topic of some newer medication stuff, the Amio, have you um, have you had good experiences with it so far? Is it something that has been so far. working? Yeah, yeah. so far. Okay. I okay. did get the privilege of putting it into a different septic joint here recently, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty happy with it. Yeah, but I have very limited experience on it. Do we have limited blood flow? Is that yes. why it's the MICs? Yes. So yeah. there's limited blood flow to begin with. And then as that degenerative process, as that inflammatory state takes effect, it really gets limited. But um, that's half the reason on the physiology of the joint that it's so dangerous to get an infection in it because it has limited that blood flow and systemically not good penetration. Mm -hmm. is, is there is an immune, immune response to white blood cells? Are they... Do they infiltrate joints as readily as other tissues? <clears throat> For the most part, yes. Oh. They're a little bit slower, um, but man, they just cannot do their job in a joint mm -hmm. like they do everywhere else. It, the joint just doesn't tolerate the inflammatory process that is needed to actually yeah. clean up a wound and clean up something that's infected. All right, well, it's 5 o'clock. Thank Dr. Kelly. Thanks, guys, for coming and listening. Yeah. 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 Yeah.